Bonjour les amis, il est uh, 10 à Redmond, uh, c'est donc le E de .NET API Review, and that is my attempt at French. Cool, um, we have a whole lot of red issues today, um, we probably won't finish them, and then we have a whole lot of non-red issues that we certainly won't even get to. So, I guess we'll get started. Add microseconds and nanoseconds to timestamp, date, time, and date, time, offset, Tadek. Yes. Uh, so this this issue actually is a very old issue, but it keeps coming every cycle. And we had this proposal long ago, and we were working on improving the proposal for a long time. Yeah, finally, we finalized this last few days or a couple of weeks. Uh, so basically, uh, currently our our date and time types that we support in the .NET uh, support up to milliseconds, and we have something called text. With, and the text units is a hundred nanoseconds. So people were asking about uh, to support uh, the the nanoseconds in addition to what we are supporting today. Uh, so basically about like the ask here is like in our ABIs, we need to, to have a way that you can create the types with the nanoseconds. And also you will have a property to return the nanoseconds part of the, of the date and uh, of the time. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, so people also, I mean, like, want <laughs> requested to go more crazy i mean like asking for more lower i mean units i mean like uh, uh, because like the lowest lowest unit we can we can get into is the text which is 100 nanoseconds and we will keep asking about like no we need more precise than that but but i we cannot we cannot i mean support lower than the text that we have today so the only missing part, I mean, in between the milliseconds and the text we support is is really the the microseconds. And the second part is the nanoseconds is just like, you know, to to give some, I mean, the, the fraction inside the time, how many nanoseconds, I mean, inside the time. I mean, so we are not like, uh, we, we just like, you know, trying to return the the, the fraction of the nanoseconds we have inside the time. <clears throat> of course, I mean, like, no, we are not providing any constructors or anything to initiate, uh, initiate the, the types with the, with the nanoseconds because, like, we already have the text. I mean, so if anybody wants to, to create the, the type with the, with the precision of nanoseconds, so they have to use the text at that time. Uh, today, I mean, like, if we didn't provide the CBIs, so people have to do their math themselves. I mean, so, so they need to get the text and try to calculate about that if how how they can get the microseconds from from this text or the nanoseconds. Uh, the, of course, I mean, like, you know, in, in .NET, we have the date time, we have date time offset, and we have the time span, and we have time only. So those are the types that we we want to support this uh, micro and nan nanoseconds there. So far, I mean, like uh, any questions so far, or would there be like total microseconds and nanoseconds, like there are for seconds and milliseconds on time span? Yeah. So yeah, we we we. Oh, I see it now. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> This would be there, yes. Yeah. Of course, I mean, like you know, we had some off offline. Dis I am not offline. I mean, on the issue itself, the discussion about like we want to make sure that we are not overflowing, or I mean, like so the implementation has to guarantee that we are not overflowing while uh, returning like the total microseconds, or or like you know, trying to create time span from the nanoseconds, for example. Right? or from microseconds. So for total nanoseconds, that's when you get, I don't know why minval would be a problem, but 
at time span dot max value it becomes not expressible in a double? It should be because double can handle any long, just not with I mean, precision. Like the, retur the return of constructed time span will not overflow, but the only the only part is like uh, the the last EBI, which is from microseconds, and this is take take the double, and this is which is like people can pass us some number that it can be outside the range and this is where we want to ensure that we are not going to sure but that'd be the same right now as you know from seconds or whatever um yeah i'm just but you have an exception on the total nanoseconds property yeah i i don't think the comment is is accurate here okay it looks like it's copy and paste from some other place yeah yeah. I'm, I'm guessing. Just... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, notably, that's just going to be ticks times 100. Uh, yeah, yeah. Nanoseconds will be in... right. Would that overflow along? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. It can. And and I think that might be why the comment was there because maybe an early iteration of this used a long and had to deal with that overflow. Right. But like like Jeremy said, there's a. A double can handle it just fine. It's just you'll lose precision, so you won't be able to round trip it correctly. That's accurate, yes. That's right. And that's because time span dot max value is basically ticks um, double, or sorry, long max value for ticks. Yeah, it goes up to long max value. Okay. Yeah, but the current from milliseconds from microseconds, from days, right? Like it's yeah. double that max value into, you know, time span from days is guaranteed an overflow. So I think even though users can express um, nanosecond precision with an add nanoseconds API, I would think it would be consistent to expose that because users can already express that with the microseconds API. If a user expresses 1.001, they're already going to, you know, lose precision there for, for add microseconds. And so it's conceptually the same as add nanoseconds 1001. Well, add microseconds takes an int. Right. So you can't add 1.01. .01. Oh, I, I meant the from microseconds, sorry. The one that's taking a double yeah. in time span. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, it makes sense. Uh, I wouldn't expose the nanoseconds in the constructor since it has to be a multiple of 100. If they want nano to specify nanoseconds, they can use ticks. Um, just because it's that weird edge case of, you know, 1 through 99 are not acceptable. Um, could, you, could you scroll right a little bit? I can't see what's on the end of those first three constructors. Oh. I see. Okay. Yeah, this is the standard date and time constructors that it can take the kind or calendar. Yeah. We have to support that. Yeah, I assume we're already inconsistent with our overloading in date time. Yeah, we have three ints comma calendar. We have five ints comma calendar. So um, this is the the correct inconsistency for date time. Since date time has add ticks, should it take int ticks on the end rather than uh, rather than int nanoseconds? You mean in the constructors? Mm -hmm. It doesn't take nanoseconds. It'd be like the tick component. It doesn't take nanoseconds at all. Right, right. right. We don't take nanoseconds because it might be confusing for users and they'd have to work with ticks anyways. I was asking, since there is an add ticks method and ticks is the next smallest unit that can be conceptualized here, should there be int nanosecond or int ticks after the microseconds? 
will be a little bit confusing because like we have another constructor that using just text. I mean, like if you add text to this overloads, it will be very confusing, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with Tarek here because all of the other concepts in this overload are concepts that are universally agreed upon as far as time goes, you know, hours, minutes, seconds, blah, blah, blah. Tix is a very Windows and .NET concept. That's right, yeah. It's not really a time unit. <laughs> it's our time unit. <laughs> yeah. And is there even a way to, like, access the Tix component? Like, it, there's no total Tix property. It's just Tix, right? So it'd be kind of weird. Well. Ticks is total ticks. But what the point is, like, if I'm just trying to find the amount of ticks that is an offset by the second, you have to do some modulus operation, right? Yeah, and we'd have, to, we'd have to also figure out what to call it. So. Yeah, yeah. there is a um, there is an API uh, called ticks per second, um, so at least you don't have to remember what to, to divide by, right? Like, we actually expose that as a constant. And it, it's not listed here because it's it's an already existing API, um, but it would look similar to what Jeremy has highlighted on the screen. Yes. Why is the ticks per nanosecond a double? Oh, I guess that's because, fraction. yeah. <laughs> yeah, a fraction. Maybe that one should be nanoseconds per tick instead, because users are going to hit a pit of failure with 0.01 because it's not exactly representable and they're going to expect it to work. We already get lots of issues with people being confused about the passing in a double and, and rounding issues. So you are suggesting instead of using double, you will use like long and we make it like uh, nanoseconds. And yeah, instead. I I inverse it. That way it's a constant and that way um, that way users are kind of forced into the path of of considering that there might be issues. Yeah. I think this this will work too. I mean, I'm not seeing a problem with it. Well, I think Tanner's point was that the uh, ticks per nanosecond, he said, is not accurately representable like you're you're going to get an approximation to one one hundredth but you're not going to get exactly one one hundredth yeah i guess even the ticks per millisecond which could have been an int is already along so being along is consistent that, with these Okay, so because we talk about, so looking at date time, everything is singular aside from ticks, um, but the proposal had microseconds, so I got rid of the S. Yeah, that um, makes sense. And need to double check time span. Only we could fix parameter names. You could go back to the compiler team and write that feature. You mean propose the feature? That's not what I said. <laughs> You're dealing with red tape. I'm getting things done. Um, yeah, and then so I switched ticks per uh, yeah, nanosecond to nanoseconds per tick. At microseconds, the parameter takes with S, right? I mean, that's OK. Um, well, what do I we am... call? I just call it value. <laughs> Apparently, everything except months calls it value. <laughs> Months. Well, months takes an int instead of. Oh, I guess because a month isn't a unit of time. A month is yeah. a foofy concept. Okay. Uh, I'm fine either way. I mean, like, to leave it like this or to call it value. 
I, I prefer what is proposed here more than value. <laughs> But it will be inconsistent. Well, but what everything else has done is also a double, and you you gave an int. Yeah, I. So. Well, what uh, what does add milliseconds take? Because we could probably just match that. Double value. Then this should probably be double value as well, just for consistency. Similarly for. It, it, does that is that okay, Tarek? Like I, I know I just kind of stomped on what you had here. Yeah, I I don't recall why they they choose integer instead of double here. I was just trying to remember about like if. Uh, I'm not seeing any problem with the double as long as we we make sure that. We are not overflowing. I mean, so it's implementation details. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I'm I'm pretty sure add seconds and other APIs already have logic to uh, detect overflow. Yeah, and it's not really overflow per se that we need to be concerned about here, but rather um, the the issues people hit when they uh, convert large tick values to a double and then it loses precision. Um, and so we, we've frequently had to go back and fix the, the logic to uh, do everything as long or you long as much as possible and only convert to, to, to double at the end to minimize precision loss. That's right. Yeah. I, I feel like, uh, Tarek, you've actually been pretty good about that within the daytime in similar classes. Yeah, we we have been like uh, fixing some issues with the precisions in general. I mean, inside the dead time, we already have another issue. I think linked to this issue, which is uh, asking to be more precise while doing this add stuff. I mean, like add seconds, add minutes, because currently we we truncate up to milliseconds while we do that, and that. The ask is to be more precise than that. So this is, I mean, this is an outlet, I mean, for .NET 7, and we are going to fix this too. We already fixed this in time span already last release, I believe. So we increased the precision of the add, add methods inside the time span. Checking the parameter names on time span. Okay, so these are plural because you know consistency, and the properties are plural. And time only almost certainly looks like date time. Me. Single, single, and it doesn't have from methods. So, <clears throat> okay, so I think we're good here. Uh, YouTube asks. Will this affect equality? Um, sort of, because as also observed in YouTube, date time is just ticks and a date time kind. Nanoseconds are an aspect of the ticks. We're just reinterpreting the data for you. It's really just ta-da. All right. Any other comments?
nanoseconds has the capital S in there. Where? The second line. You you did a capital S in nanoseconds. Thank you. But I didn't hear which matches what we did everywhere else, which matches what we did for microsecond. So, cool. All right. Okay. Allow access to child providers and change configuration provider 44486. Ooh, uh, Miriam. Yes. Okay. Um, so for this one, it will be just a matter of exposing providers. And then um, the reason for that is when we have change configuration, we had this API. Um, if someone used that, to um, uh, so basically if someone wanted to kind of let's say refresh uh, at a later date some of their um, values and which is a very specific corner case um, that would kind of um, unblock one customer scenario and um, there's no really better way for them to accomplish what this other than for us providing this, exposing this providers. Because once you use the change configuration provider, the providers would be lost. But the good thing is that if someone uses configuration manager in the future, they really won't need to be concerned with it. So like in the future, uh, this is just in order, this API would just only be for people who want to get unblocked for a specific use case, but it's not really something that's like um, aimed for anything other than just unblocking a specific use case. That's not possible otherwise. And Halter, I think you're also on the call. So um, you also have um, opinions on this. Um. Yeah, it's, it's a little weird. So like what this seems to be is that um, Azure Key Vault developers want a way to, from a service, uh, like an ASP.NET service, uh, update their configuration sources. Um, you know, say that the backing Key Vault like updated or something. It's my understanding of the issue that kind of led to this API proposal. Um, and right now, just the way the ASP.NET host works, um, config is set up before services. Um, and there's no way to like reverse the dependency order there. So this is kind of a way that Azure Key Vault has accessed their config provider from a service after like the ASP.NET app has started. Um, this seems to work decently well. Like the issue they're running into when this happened is that if someone added the key vault source in um, host dot configure host configuration callbacks, um, it gets chained um, basically to the main configuration builder that builds the I configuration that everything else uses. And what happens is like when you inject an I configuration um, into an ASP.NET service, um, you have access to the providers, which normally don't have access to DI, but you can kind of like flip the dependency, right? As soon as they can like as cast their provider. That's what's happening here. Um, this fix is kind of incomplete. Sorry, um, was there a question? Okay, so like my, my thing that I don't like about it is basically that it's trying to fight the system in general, um, but they're already doing this um, and this, basically allows them to access like chain providers. So it makes kind of the thing they're doing work better. Um, it, it still doesn't work in certain scenarios. Um, so for instance, imagine that you took a, a section of um, 
your Azure Key Vault um, configuration. Um, and, and that's something you can do, like configuration docket section, um, and use that as your chain configuration source. Like, then this still doesn't work because an iConfiguration section doesn't have providers on it. Um, but I, uh, I don't know. It's I, I will say that this isn't a type that many people will see. So it, it makes their thing work slightly better. I, I'm sorry if that's like super confusing. Like it's like it's way into the more complicated intricacies of like the ASP.NET hosting model. Yeah. Since no one else has questions or comments yet. Um, the three off the top of my head are uh, one, you're currently intentionally not exposing this back. So are you uh, confident in your decision to start exposing the data? Uh, two, do you want to be I enumerable or do you need struct enumerator type things? And Three, if you don't need a struct enumerator, is I enumerable still the right choice, or is there a stronger type that you can expose? Looking at it, like I don't even see multiple unchained configuration provider. I just see one. So in the chain configuration provider, like the the way the only way I can see this implemented is it would cast the i configuration it has to an i configuration root so it as cast it if it is it would expose i configuration root dot providers. And that's I enumerable of I configuration provider. And honestly, I've kind of questioned why I configuration root exposes that. I wasn't there, I don't think, during that initial design. Um, clearly, Azure Key Vault uses it um, to refresh their providers. So this makes it work in more cases. This makes it work if you've chained a configuration root to another configuration root. It doesn't work for sections. If you wanted to work for sections, you could try exposing providers on iConfiguration section, but I don't think you'd want to go that far. Why not just con expose the configuration that's backing the chain configuration provider? Um, and then they can do yeah. with it whatever they want? Honestly, I, I think I slightly prefer that. Or more clear what the limitations are. They'd have to be doing the as casting to I configuration root and so forth. But at least they can, right? Today right, they, exactly. Today they can't get access to anything in, in it. No, I, I hear you. And it makes it kind of more explicit what the limitations are. Like, all we know is that we have an I configuration. We don't know that we can give you providers. Anyway. Yeah, I mean... You know, the, the only thing you take in the constructor for this is a chained configuration source, so you could even just expose the source back. Does the chain configuration source expose the uh, I configuration? Yeah. Yep. Okay, yeah, you could do that too. Do we ever do that on any other providers where we... No. Because it, it's kind of like... The, the public, the public way you, you, normally it's like you build up a source and then you call build on it, and then that gives you a provider. And normally those providers don't hold back, to, references back to the source. I mean I agree that the the constructor takes it. No, I mean if the yeah if the right level of configure or of exposure is the, I configuration. Thing. Like I, I have no idea of what any of this is, so I just, uh, <laughs> I just ask questions. No, I I like your original proposal, Eric. Um, 
to just expose the eye configuration. I mean, it's a backing field already on it. Its source only has one configuration. I, I don't see any harm in doing that. And, th and then it solves kind of a bunch of Jeremy's questions about, like, can we do something more specific than I enumerable? Right. Yeah, the main thing I disliked about it is, like, sometimes you are just unable to get providers because you have, like, an I configuration section um, and not an I configuration read. So, I mean, yeah, this is just a lot more straightforward and opens up the same possibilities, if not more. Do you have any thoughts on that, Miriam? I think that makes sense. Just, yeah, to expose the configuration. Yeah, public. Not nullable. The ah source that if source configuration is null, then oh yeah, then it, it fails. Okay, should be nullable. No, no, no. It's uh, oh yeah, yeah. There is a null check. Yep. Sure. I only read the that bang bang is destroying my ability to read code. Um, because I saw only one null check, so obviously it was checking the parameter, but it was checking a property on the parameter, which is that. I'm, over, I'm, I'm just confused about one thing. Overall, whenever in an app we, we inject iConfiguration, we always get, get the same iConfig, right? So, but I assume this one, when we're exposing iConfiguration here, we're trying to expose the sources, the change configuration sources configuration. Yep. But if configuration is always the same that's injected, we cannot, like, uh, I'm... They're just trying to walk all, they're trying to walk all the providers in the configuration. If you scroll down, I actually have, like, the recursive pseudocode for what they'd write with the old API. I mean, you just update it um, to do as mm -hmm. I configuration root dot providers. Because they have their own, this refresher thing is their own thing. Mm -hmm, and so yeah. they're trying to find all the ones that implement refresher so they can do some stuff with it. But once they hit a chained one, it's like a black box and they can't get inside of it. Yeah. Okay. And then they would just change this to I configuration, and then it would move this cast to inside the loop but. yep yeah yep exactly which is probably a more appropriate general fix for them anyway okay so this button all right so we like that instead yes you put public on the property or is it just assumed Pretty sure I wrote public. We'll see you in a minute. I totally wrote public. <laughs> Any other feedback? But consumers of memory cache access metrics 50406. Isn't this like the fifth week running? No, I will. We uh, missed it last week. <laughs> um, so, what I want to do is I will uh, get back to this next week because I just before this meeting met with Adam and he wanted some uh, use cases, use, use case samples for like metrics, API, and event counter that use it with multiple memory caches. So, I'll just uh, yeah, uh, asked to talk about this next week once I have the okay. boots up. So, not ready yet. No. Add more string syntax type constants to string syntax attribute 65634. Uh, Mr. Tobe.
All right, finally found the unmute button. Uh, so we, um, a few months back, we added this new string syntax attribute, um, which allows us to uh, attribute in typically parameters, but it also works on fields and properties uh, that are strings or read-only spans of char or whatever the, uh, the tools can recognize and allows us to basically say, this is a domain specific language effectively, you know, this is JSON or this is a regular expression or this is a date time format string. Um, and those are the three that we currently have uh, as of now. Um, but there are many other languages effectively that we have across the core libraries. Um, uh, and there was a proposal made, which I tweaked to add more of these. Um, and so these are the ones that I think makes sense for us to ship in seven based on how we would use them and other proposals that others have made. Uh, so just going that quickly through the list, uh, composite format strings, you know, these are the things that are passed to string.format or string builder.append format. There's a whole lot of APIs that take that string and this would allow, for example, Visual Studio to use similar syntax coloring as it does for an interpolated string uh, on uh, as you're, you know, typing out a format string, or would allow it to provide errors, um, you know, in the IDE, like a, a la an analyzer, to say that this is malformed. Or we could do that with analyzers as well, because we can just look at it and say, oh, you know, this parameter is a composite format string, and it's not properly formatted. Warning. Um, we previously had a date time format, which we use in a bunch of places on date time, on date time offset, uh, but uh, we couldn't use it on date. Uh, date only because date time format also allows for time strings. So uh, date format would be usable when there's just date component. Similarly, uh, time format for time only. Um, enum format, you know, enum dot uh, two string and try format uh, or enum dot parse uh, supports uh, specific uh, ways of rendering enums. GUID, similarly, two string try parse. Uh, numeric format, all of our numerical types, uh, their two strings and tri formats uh, uh, have a, a very specific set of format specifiers that are allowed. Um, and this allows, for example, like if you look at date time, uh, date time uh, dot tri format, for example, in the IDE, Visual Studio will put up a menu showing all the different things that you can do. And the idea is it'll be able to do that for all of our numerical types. Similarly for time span format. And then the last two are uh, for URIs. So for parameters that are strings that are you know, actually supposed to be URIs and then things that are XML. Um, the, uh, there was one, there were two others, three others that were proposed uh, that I have not included here. Uh, one of which is SQL. And uh, most of this issue is discussing should we have a SQL thing? Uh, and you know, the sticking point being there's lots of different um, dialects. So what would we do? And the, the current thinking that has been expressed is you know, don't do anything right now. Um, uh, another one that was suggested was base 64. Um, but I, I don't think that's valuable because no one uh, I mean, it's it's often the case. It's there are certainly cases where base sixty four is passed in as a string to an API, but I never see a developer typing that out by hand. It's always coming in from some config file or something where, you know, the it, you wouldn't be passing in a constant one that someone typed out manually. Um, and then the last one was, you know, should we have like C sharp, Visual Basic? Um, and there was some pushback from the Roslyn folks around. Well, do what's your scenario? Like, do we actually have APIs where you're typing in C sharp or VB or F sharp or whatever? Um, and so I'm suggesting we not add anything for that right now. Um, and if you want, you can scroll down. I have a commit or a set of commits somewhere below that's linked that shows all the places we would roll this out. Uh, and it's uh, quite, yeah, right there. And it's relatively extensive, uh, the number of places we can, um, we can take advantage of these. Oh, come on, Steve. That, not even a four-digit number. Yeah, sorry. Um, so that's the idea. Right, so all the things that take format, and that's the composite format because you don't actually know what it's applying to.
Um, so, it sounded reasonable to me, with the uh, exception, or the one question I have, I guess. Uh, you mentioned, you know, we have that time only couldn't use date time format, so we have time format. Should we be more clear and call it time only format and up here date only format? I'm so, fine with that. So that you that want well. date only format, time only format, or the date time format. Yeah, and this gets back to it. <laughs> really gets back to a whole can of worms we don't want to reopen around the naming of date only and time only. Uh, I have my I, I have no qualms renaming these if that's preferred. Anyone want to express a opinion one way or the other? For numeric format. Um, is it important to differentiate integers from non-integers? Uh, you tell me. I would think yes, just because, um, uh, there's potential perf considerations and rounding issues. Um, there's is the some... Is the syntax different? If what I got gathered for the documentation is the syntax is the same and the specifiers that are allowed is the same. I guess the question is, what would a tool do differently? Um, it'd be able to know that the that the integer uh, that that it's an exactly representable value rather than something that might potentially truncate around. But I mean, like if you, show you decimal places. if you call, you know, int dot two string g three, that does that ignore the g three? Does it ignore the three because it makes no sense? Like. Unless it's going to produce an error, I, this this is basically my understanding is basically for syntax highlighters, um, is the primary example. And okay. if the G is not going to be a format exception, then we wouldn't say that there's an integer format versus a, a floating it, point it, format. It's certainly possible there's a use case that uh, you know we haven't thought of yet, or that I haven't been thinking about. The ones that I'm aware of are. Uh, you know, a tool being able to, like Visual Studio being able to provide you with a menu of, of options available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's basically IntelliSense syntax completion. Um, there's syntax colorization. Uh, there is syntax validation. So, you know, squigglies and custom errors. Um, uh, and then, you know, anything that an, an analyzer might be able to do as well, like, um, which is mostly in this sort of syntax validation realm. You know, this is not valid JSON, but you're passing this to something expecting JSON. If there's another category you're thinking of, Tanner, around performance, and you think we could, for example, write an analyzer that would do something meaningful, I'm certainly open to it. Uh, yeah. It's just not, I hadn't considered a split based on yeah. correctness, I guess. I guess the, the other thing would be that there's, so, so we have a set of standard numeric specifiers. Um, but and all of them are supported on integers, but not all of them are supported on floats today or decimal. So do we throw if you pass one of those? Um. Yeah. Uh, yes. I. Uh, sorry. I was trying. Um. I believe yes. There used to be the weird edge case where we interpreted certain things as a custom numeric specifier rather than an explicit specifier, and I think we fixed that. Um, so I believe we do throw today if you, for example, do float x uh, or float dot two string x. Um, although there is a pro there is an approved proposal to support hexadecimal based float formatting because that's a well defined standard. But but at least today we don't support uh, don't don't support it on floating point. Well, because I mean that that there gets weird because if we say well it's already in the table so we can add it then that means that the two formats would converge which means we would have wished we just said numeric format so i think that that's fair to me that says we should leave it as one because we want to say oh look all the things that are in the numeric formatting table because that's just all we called it in the docs are are valid on all the types and if they're not then maybe we would fix that so yeah, i mean the thing that the thing I'd like to avoid, and this is this is sort of the same issue we have with daytime format, is 
you know, this, a, a Visual Studio, for example, pops up a menu that shows all the things you're allowed to do. And I would certainly be swayed if that for, you know, float.toString showed you something that would result in runtime failures. I don't yeah. want that. Um, so if we think that, you know, in .NET, when we ship .NET 7, that would actually be a concern, then we, we should split it. If we don't, then I think it simpler is better. Yeah, I, I think the only two that would be problematic is uh, float double, half, and decimal with X, and then the integer types with R. I think those are the two throwing cases. I think P, N, G, F, E, D, C, E are implemented across the board. Right, so, you know, let's take this and throw generic math at it. So you're taking a I number, and you have a format. If we separate, I mean, we could make special subsections in addition to the general numeric format, but it's like, what attribute would you put on it if you were pretty printing your results from generic math? Do we take... Do uh, Tanner, correct me if I'm wrong, our generic interfaces, we, ha we have uh, formatting and parsing APIs, but they don't take format strings, do they? They do. They do? Yeah, because they implement iFormatable, um, which takes a format specifier. Right, right. That's that's on the, con like the, the implementation on the concrete type does, but there's no generic math interface that adds a new one. Right. Uh, that... <clears throat> I, I number itself um, adds uh, the variants that take number style. Right, but not a string format. Uh, right, because number style is for parsing, not for not for formatting. So right. for formatting, I don't think we're adding anything new. I think that's right. Because we can we can you know what, whatever we have like on you know. Uh, on int32 dot whatever we can add the right thing, and on iformatable dot two string we're not going to add any of this because it's it, there's nothing we could pick that would be relevant. So it would only be a concern if we had on i numeric, whatever, a new one. I, I think I remember I, I explicitly looked for that and I didn't see one. Right, but I mean even like you could, I guess, this is the how would you get back into the, uh, what would you call passing the format string into? Would be the question, but no. If I formatable takes the format string and all numbers are I formatable, then it's if you had a a custom function that took that was all generic mathy and took a format string for some reason, like right. But that but we would the, the only place we would put the attribute would be on I formatable dot two strings parameter. Well, it'd be on we put... but it'd be on the on the attribute for this particular method that took string format. Like not what, anything what in the method? in a thing someone wrote utilizing generic. Oh, math. oh, oh, oh! You're you're saying someone writes uh, format my cool thing that uh, accepts uh, a string format and a T numeric. Yeah. And got it. And they, what are they going to put on it? Right. Yeah. I guess That's... this was. Go ahead, finish. Oh, I was going to say. I mean, that that is an argument for having one rather than multiple. And maybe the simple thing is to just say that for numeric to string, um, we just we should just go ahead and since since X is already approved, just not implemented for floating point, that just leaves long term R, which is the round trip format, not working for integers, and there's really no reason we couldn't support that since that's just the same as G. Uh, it makes sense to just go and do and support a generic math, probably. Yeah, and and then and then we just have uh, numeric format is any standard numeric format string, and the recommendation for users is to support them. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So. So I think the changes I heard were date only format and time only format. Yep. Anything else? Cool go. So 
So wh wh which of these attributes is being put on iformatable since iformatable can be implemented by any type? None of them. N none of them. And is there a way for us to specify on i number that the relevant interfaces it's inheriting uh, are effectively numeric format? Like, can we put this attribute on the I number I think, interface type? I think we would need to implement, to add a, the appropriate method to that interface to effectively redefine it. Uh, could, could we could we solve that by making by allowing the attribute to be put on a type as well as a me method? And uh, allow it to be on a type and specify the member it applies to. Yeah, that that would work as well. And then we could on i number uh, put um, numeric format to specify that anything that implements i number should support the numeric format for its two string. I think something there is probably reasonable, but it would probably need to be fleshed out and be a separate yeah. discussion. Yeah, because yeah, I think that's fine. Because now it's you implement two interfaces and they have conflicting values. What what does the IDE do? Yeah. Um, uh, I formatable could take composite format, right? Like there shouldn't be anything you can give to I formatable that's not a valid composite format. No, it, pretty much everything is not about composite format. I formatable two string typically takes the format specification for the right. value. Right, right, right. It takes so you, the uh, the like why 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 not. Apparently, my windows are getting washed because my neighbor is getting hers washed. <laughs> um, the, uh, right. So it, it takes only the part that goes inside the, the curly bracket, the not the... Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Do we have Carlos? We have Carlos. Yes. All right. Uh, Carlos. Tar six five nine five one. Carlos. Uh, so this is a continuation of uh, the other week's uh, conversation. Uh, we discussed uh, how Tar works and the general structure of the proposed APIs. Um, I addressed uh, the feedback and updated the proposal. I hope it shows up. Yeah, it shows up. Uh, the main thing we wanted to confirm was if we wanted this to be an OOP package or be added to the shared framework. And we uh, decided that it needs to be added to the shared framework because we're doing some uh, native syscalls on Linux that do not have a public API surface. So yeah, that's the main restriction. Uh, the other feedback that I received was uh, we should change the name of add file to write entry. That's in tar entry at the top. And I changed it right there. Yeah, just to be named add file, but we wanted it to be named write entry. And the only difference is either you receive a file name or you receive an entry to write. Uh, the other feedback we received, uh, changing old regular file to a more appropriate name. Um, that's the enum at the top called, re and the name would be regular file B7 because that's the only part format where it's used. Now, oh, Joe is uh, mentioning that uh, we are P invoking. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is the native. To... I didn't mean to, to interrupt. Uh, but basically, just completing your, your comment on syscalling into non-public API. Basically, what what that means is we're actually p invoking into uh, system native. Um, so so, which of course it doesn't have a public contract, so we can't have this uh, be a noob. Unless we, we, there's there, we, there's a separate talk that uh, uh, with Eric's uh, effort, uh, Eric Earhart's effort, uh, we might be able to. Uh, uh, like create manage APIs for the things that we actually are invoking into and uh, eventually in that way we could move this uh, but it's not straightforward 
for sure. It depends how much we care. I mean, we could NuGet packages can have native assets, and then we can yeah we can build We've shims dedicated to this library. Right. I told I I, I told Carlos about the system uh, IOPorts case, which is the only case we have in in the framework that does this. So it's oob and p is into its own native shim. It hasn't been a great experience. I don't think it's a good model to follow. Um, I told him the risks, and I think that, uh, yeah, we decided that for now we can we can, can make it part of the set framework. And sorry, go ahead. Can we not accomplish what we want with Bono Posix? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't like, know if Carlos. If, if it's just Bono. about things like you know calling stat. Uh, if... I think it was yeah it was some some of it was calling ch mod but I think that it was something else right Carlos I think that you were actually writing some uh, additional code in, in native or yeah there more about changing the mode uh, writing a FIFO um, device a block device and character device uh, getting the UID and the group ID those are uh, the new POSIX APIs. Uh, uh, it, would, it would be interesting to, to explore trying to get away with just referencing Monoposix package and then see if that gets you uh, uh, what you want. Uh, basically, what, what I asked them is, what was the reasoning of wanting this as an OOP package? And I think it was in order to support VS. Um, and so one, one other alternative that we thought about was maybe uh, p having this part of the ship framework uh, and then having a specific uh, NuGet package that only shipped the Windows asset, uh, which doesn't have any native dependency, uh, which is it's not it's not a great idea. Of course, it has a lot of cons, uh, but it's just another another thing that we could explore. Basically, let me ask another higher level question. I mean, obviously, we we are implementing this on Windows, where these you know some of the concepts enumerated don't exist. What would happen if we just didn't implement that stuff on Unix? Like, is it would would it be considered a fail if we didn't set permissions appropriately based on? I'm I'm assuming the ch mod was because when you create one of these things, you're storing into the tar the permissions and then you're trying to recreate them upon extraction. Like, yeah. what would happen if we just didn't do that? Uh, maybe that's a we terrible idea. Use, but like, uh, if we, we, if could we basically use the just default, said like, like we were doing in C, but there. We actually got an issue there, uh, people requesting to respect the the mode and to make sure that we extracted the files with the mode with all the zip files. And uh, remember, Eric Earhart fixed that. So I expect that people will, would end up requesting mode to be respected. I don't know For about sure the I other. Sure, I think mode, right? Like. If I if I tar a file a, a directory up today, like using command line and then untar it somewhere else, I, the file permissions pop up. So I I wouldn't know why our API wouldn't do that. Right. I, I'm asking purely because of the discussion of dependencies. Dependencies aside, I think that is the correct behavior. Uh, I, I I agree with that. But we're, we're talking about making trade-offs. So it is a fair discussion is what are the right trade-offs to be making. Right, and, mm -hmm. and I assume that uh, chmod is part of Monoposix. It is, yeah. And probably also set UID, set GID. Um, if you're the like three people on the planet who have turned on POSIX ACLs for your uh, Unix file system, then it probably also has that. So really the question is, yeah, if it's simply because we're doing things that we don't have a system dot API to call into, I assume from .NET runtime we're allowed to call monoposix, and if not, we don't have to build this library in .NET runtime. We actually aren't. Today, we can't. Sorry, I didn't follow that. Monoposix gets built in a different repo that we don't have a dependency on. And so we would have to like bring it into source build and... Right, or move this out. 
Nothing okay. says all the code we write has to go in .NET runtime. Okay. I, I'm just brainstorming things, right? Like, uh, would we still call it system dot if it wasn't in .NET runtime? Uh, that we, we have IoT. It, it, yeah. It lives outside and it's system dot. IoT, WCF, WPF. Yeah. Like, system dot probably has some hierarchy of um, authority, but that doesn't say where it builds from. What repo would you put it in? Oh. On that tar. I mean, like I a long time ago, I uh, you know back when back when we had Wes, uh, I was saying to him I thought it would be great if we had all of our oobs not build in the same repository as all the stuff that's in shared framework, and then that would make it much more clear what is and isn't oob, and that would make our servicing stories easier. Um, is the SDK going to use this? That was going to be my next question as well. Or anything that's in the SDK package, right? Like NuGet or um, ASP.NET or... We'd certainly like them to. I think SDK would. I think it would be, a, 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 uh, with all due respect, a failure of our efforts here if we couldn't use these ourselves. Right, I mean, that's just a logistical aspect of that means that we need to be able to tie it into source build somewhere uh, if but it it's also like we consolidated repos for reasons right and now we're saying let's just explode repos if sure explode. but again another answer I mean you know we Microsoft own I think mono so we could pull mono POSIX into building somewhere we control like we can pull it into the source build universe if that's if that's the only thing stopping some scenario, like it's, we have a current reason why, oh, this can't be oob, but if we change some of the preconditions, it could be. And so I don't know, you know, Emo, what's our general strategy for completely new things? Do we want to be oob by default or do we want to be inbox by default? I'm not sure if he's in the call. I thought I saw his little headshot earlier. Of course, I know he's busy today, so he may not actually be paying attention to us. I guess no, one, I'm, I'm, one other question. He has to get the oh. new button to, to actually work. So, um, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, no, I'm not Uber by default. The general strategy is we're inbox by default for core functionality, and it's that's, like, by default, you know, basically .NET 7 or .NET app, uh, or higher, right? But in this case, you know, based on our interactions with VS, who was basically saying they would like to use the feature, that's when we basically said, okay, if VS wants to use the feature and they're a primary customer, then, well, we would have to support them, right? And that would mean OOP because we have no way of having VS use a .NET Core only comp component, right? Um, but again, like, I think they're, they're largely orthogonal issues. I think we can totally say we have an inbox version of this thing that, that you know, should, you know, works well in .NET Core, is cross-platform, and then what we give VS is either you know, a, a limited version of that that only supports Windows, for example, although in this case, I don't think this would work because they want to package stuff that runs in Docker. But I think it's okay to say our OOP version is somehow limited, right? And if we really, really, really needed to do something crazy, like giving them an unsupported private effectively, we could do that too, right? But I think we should always start with, you know, the single sin box, it's, it's, it's where it's designed to work. And then we design effectively our OOP behavior as secondary step. Ideally, before we ship, but you know we should, we should get the inbox solution figured out first. Fair enough, because uh, the the suggestion of we have a Windows only OOP package feels weird to me. Um, like if we're exposing it as net standard, because that's what VS needs to consume it as, then that just feels yeah like a little weird of what happens when you hit a Unix system. It throws and says, sorry, if you can't unify with the runtime, this doesn't work. So it works on .NET framework on Windows 7, but doesn't work on Linux with .NET Core 3.1. Like this. Yeah, you would basically have to play the game of putting placeholders, which would freeze APIs for some frameworks, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a 
good place to be in for sure. I think from my perspective, if, if this is really important, we implement native shims and we're done with it. Sorry, I think we are still missed the part. Like, why do we think we couldn't do cross implementation? Is it not? Why we couldn't do what, Emo? I think so it was. My a... impression was that this, is this isn't it a purely managed implementation that does some binary. Processing? It it needs to call into some uh, you know OS functionality for things like uh, chmod. In oh, chmod can just be a, a p invoke. With that one, we do it in other places and it works just fine. You don't actually same, need same to shim for that You one. mean the actual applying the attribute when you extract the file, not reading the attribute when you're packaging the file, right? We need both. Yeah. We need both ways. Can we? What's the current? Can we p invoke into chmod? Um, does that work? Whether it's musl or libc. Sorry, Musil or glibc? Because they both answer to libc, I think. Provided right, they're both exposing the the standardized API, then it should just work. I just mean, is it the same library targeter? I guess if not, we just have to figure out the this bind failed call the other one. So Carlos, apart from chmod, like, is there any other API that you had to call and you had to write the native implementation because there wasn't a team yeah, vote there, that there's could stat, use? right? Stats a hard one. Uh, well, that one already existed. Uh, also, hard link already existed. Uh, the ones that I had to add myself were for FIFO, for creating FIFO files, for creating character devices and block devices, and. Um, uh, a few days ago, I also found that I would have to write the ones for uh, uname and gname. I said UID just now, but I meant uname and gname. But you mean in system native, right? Yeah, I think. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so those we couldn't call. I guess the question was more can we get away with just calling libc directly, invoking into libc? And we can, it's just fragile in many cases. Yeah, it is. There, there are some, can, I, can I make a bold suggestion? We spent half an hour talking about the things that we know we can achieve. Why don't we just assume we can figure out the right answer and focus on the APIs? Yeah. I was gonna say, so what's what's the impact on the API proposal of this decision? That that's why I was asking about the would we would we consider removing functionality? And I think the resounding response from people was. Steve, you're crazy. In which case, I don't think it has any effect on the APIs. I mean, I think the the FIFO and the the character devices are like are those are super important. Like, uh, probably not. Or is that, but, or is that but just they are a... part of the functionality that is supported by Tar. It's a, an entry type that Tar can handle. It can archive them and can extract them. And people use those? Probably not that common, but I mean, we can uh, we can certainly say that in the in a version that lives in a NuGet package, extract a directory throws if it sees a FIFO or a character device or a block or it device. Saves it a different type. Uh, but then the inbox type works, and it's like this works in .NET seven. It doesn't work on .NET Core three one, and it doesn't work on Windows. Uh, I'll, I'll sh show some tar naivety here. What does it mean to extract a FIFO from a tar file? Uh, you create a, a FIFO file in the file system that you would from the console. Right, but um, FIFOs, they're, they're, they're pipes. They're... Yeah, it basically calls make pipe. It's the name of where you want the pipe but, on the file system. But you, don't, you typically don't pre-populate those with data. Like, they're someone else is listening to it and reading from it as you're writing to it. So what does it mean to extract it to disk? To make the be uh, And But I've got a gigabyte of data in my tar file that's destined for a FIFO. What, 
the if it's a FIFO, uh, so Carlos, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of tar is if it sees a FIFO or a block device or a character device, all it writes down is in the directory table, there was a character device here named this. Uh, it So it recreates it with those attributes. Same with a FIFO. It says, it just calls make pipe and says there's now a pipe there's here no, named there's Steve. No data associated. Yeah, you can't have data associated with those. It, it's just the file system okay. entry. You're yeah, like right. extracting an app or something like that. Like if you're using this for your installer and then your app wanted to like yeah. read and write to that file, it assumes it's there. That's the scenario ish. Yeah. It's, I have a, I built a directory structure that looks like this on this one system. I want to now restore from back, like tar was invented for backup restore. It's tape archive, right? That's what it stands for. The, so, so it's, my file system is in a state I'm happy with, back it up, now restore it. So if IFO only has memory or data in it as long as the system's running. Uh, so this is, what would the system look like after you rebooted? So the goal of perfect fidelity with the format is a great goal, and, and it may very well be that it's the right answer. Uh, this does seem like something that is probably extremely rarely used. Yeah, and the, the, I think like I, said, I think it would be completely fine if create from directory and extract to directory fail with exotic file types as the net standard implementation, and that those those block devices, character devices, FIFOs start working when you get to .NET 7. Like if we get the unified implementation, like we'll have to figure out what the right stuff with the packaging is to make sure that we don't get the newer version net standard unifying over the inbox net core and breaking things. But like that's a that's a problem that Eric St. John knows how to solve. I would say we know how to solve, but really only Eric knows how to solve it. And uh, like so we can we can do things with technology. So it it's from you know this group. Uh, really, I think that the interesting question is, if it's an oob, does that change anything in the API shape? And if it's not an oob, does that change anything in the API shape? Uh, because if we're just talking, what are the things that we can achieve functionally and what are the design changes that we want to do for TAR? I think we need a different meeting for that. Well, could we split the APIs? Um if we don't reach a consensus here and initially not support these uh, file types that would require new uh, native call, be FIFO, character device, block device. Right, so, so what would change? Uh, okay, you, you touched the topic earlier. You said that the tar file APIs, like create from directory or extract to directory, is one of those files is encountered in, in the entire file. Uh, we can throw or we can skip it. I don't know what would be the best scenario or maybe we can process everything and then throw at the end uh, to let the user know we found this, but everything else was extracted. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be the same cluster of debate that's going on with uh, um, copy recursively right now, but uh, the answer is it could still work right um excuse me we, we wouldn't need to change we, we don't need to add any parameters we don't need to you know remove anything it's we still have create directory it still has the same signature yes the exception behavior is part of the api design but i, I think that we can kind of hand wave that off as implementation detail a little bit from the perspective of this meeting I think we all agree that it's good to have a consistent story and an understandable story, um, but I don't think we need to care super much about does it throw early or throw late in this meeting. Okay. Uh, another question that Stephen asked, um, I think I saw what happened to the what would happen to the permissions when you extract, say, a file that you create in Unix and you extract it in Windows, uh, I think the expected behavior would be that, well, the mode would be ignored. And in the opposite direction, if you create a tar on Windows and extract it on Unix, then the mode would have a default value for all the files. I think it's 744, 
755 and remember exactly the value. Uh, we would document it, of course. Um, I mean, to use the UMAX, the UMask for the process. The read, the read only uh, <laughs> bit on Windows oh. could certainly be replicated into the read only or read or not read on. Sorry, write or not write in uh, Unix, but. And my question is more generally, what do we do with concepts from one OS that aren't supported by the other OS? Uh, that applies to permissions, that applies to fi uh, kinds of, you know, uh, kinds of files, et cetera. It should be consistent with zip, right? Yeah, if you archive something, uh, a file on Windows, I would say that U name and G name, UID, GID would be empty. It should still work when extracting that archive on Linux. Um, what happens I if I, what do we do if I have a FIFO on Unix and I extract that on Windows? We just ignore it, we throw, we- I would say something. ignore. Yeah, I would say ignore. Uh, I mean, uh, we can decide that now we can ignore or we can throw at, or throw at the end after we extract everything else and just let the user know. There's, we finish. Also, <clears throat> there's also the case of uh, um, if you have WSL installed, Windows or Windows has an official format to specify uh, owner group file mode permissions, etc. on in the NTFS file system now using the extended attributes. So we should theoretically be able to express everything on Windows if we really wanted or needed to. Yeah, and YouTube chat points out that uh, Windows 10 comes with tar.exe. So um, we can, if Windows tar, you know, prints an error when it hits a FIFO, then that would mean that we would throw. It probably prints an error and moves on and does everything else, which would suggest that we want to throw late. But um, but the fact that there is a, an officially distributed version of TAR for Windows that is built into Windows, that means that we can... I mean, Stay consistent with We them. can use that as a basis for doing things or not doing things. Certainly, we shouldn't let it be the only thing we do. Otherwise, we would just shell out to it. Um, okay. But... Uh, so some of these subtle questions, again, I don't think it's super right for this group unless you're down to two things and it's what do you think the most consistent API behavior is, but I don't think that we really want to design the edge cases of the feature by community without having data. Yeah, I'm basically asking them because the proposal is extremely uh it's full fidelity, or at least it's supposed to be with the format, and that suggests that everything then is supported. So my questions are basically, will everything be supported, or do we need to pull back on the surface area and, and only expose the things that we can actually support? If we believe we can be full fidelity and we have answers for everything, great. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I, I think really it's only the convenience methods. And if we're ever concerned about the convenience methods, we can just cut them. And it can be, if you want to use tar, here's a reader, go go deal with it yourself, implementation on top of the primitives. Um, because everything that's a file at a time can is either this succeeds or this fails when you're reading or writing. It's only the, like, go do everything at once that has questions. So that's interesting. If we got rid of the static class, or if we excluded the static class tar file, we would have zero native dependencies um, tar writer dot write entry with a file name would want to call stat. Yeah, no, we would but still have it. the dependencies. Uh, stat, there's, there will be another one. There's an extract to file. Is it, it's in tar entry, a few lines below. Extract to file, yeah. If you are iterating on an archive creator in Unix and you extract it on Windows and it's a FIFO, well, 
the, right, the but again, with the single phone, file, if it's in Unix, it would be calling the make FIFO. The make single FIFO. file for Windows on for a FIFO is presumably going to throw. Or I think when, I don't remember if Windows has make pipe or not. But like, if that's a hey, there's a thing here. I literally can't like I can't create a character device on Windows. This makes no sense. Um, then right. then we would throw and the the single file operations totally make sense. It's this cannot be done on this platform. Um, yeah. It's only and the the compound things, and similarly, that's where we're running into problems with copy director or copy recursively, uh, with the PR that's out. Is well, something went wrong. When do we throw? How much do we do? And how much information so comes wrong in the failure? My my question is just: there's another lever we can pull here if we're going to have you know a, a one built into .NET seven and a, a down level targeting that standard. Another level we can pull is get rid of all the APIs that would be pro problematic. Have the core reader writer support parsing, but we expose, you know, there's no extract a file. We expose it as a stream and someone has to copy it out themselves. We could do that if we wanted. It, basically, the, the net standard surface area is just smaller. So if it's just one other choice we can make, you know, we can ship shims, we can change the surface area, we can right. whatever we want to do. But I think we've beaten this horse to death. Right. For the only, let's just, let's yeah, the only this thing that box. I recall that was a benefit if we were inbox is that it could, we could have compression things built in as a dependency in a way that we couldn't if it's oob. But it doesn't sound like you're adding any of that in the proposal right now, so it's still oob capable. Oh. So I, I don't think there's anything really for us to talk about. If we want to come back and say that we want to cut, drop the tar file type for the net standard version because of the reasons we've discussed as Steve just said, then sure. And I think that we would say, okay, that makes sense. We're dropping a whole type that that's easy. The uh, type and the extract the file and anything else of that ilk. Anything that goes into the file system, we only leave the APIs that deal with streams. That is a possibility. Yeah. It'd be like, whatever, we can give you the data stream that was in the file. We can tell you all the attributes that were there. And if you can call monoposix, you can write it. Um, like that is it. We can make the convenient APIs only be available in Net Seven while making the basic support for Tar and VS can do a little bit of work on top of that for Net Framework. Like no matter what, we do want this in the shared framework. Do we? Is that I, I, that, that that's a question I'm asking. Like if, if if this was just an oob library, like dependencies aside, and we're like, yeah, we're going to support net standard 2.0 on this, would we also put it in the shared framework? And For me, it depends on who we actually expect to be using it. If we expect someone else, the SDK, ASP.NET, such that we would end up shipping it in some shared framework anyway, like or you know, in the SDK, it, it's a part of all the downloads. I'm not sure it really matters. Might as well just put it in one place and do the quote, quote, easy thing. If we don't think any, if we're not gonna end up using it in any of our stuff ourselves, there's the only benefit to the shared framework or the primary benefit to the shared framework is being able to share stuff in the shared framework. Um, and at that point, that's, just, I'm, I'm exaggerating here, but to some extent, that's us being a little bit lazy. Uh, besides Visual Studio, uh, PowerShell expressed interest in having tar, tar APIs so that they can write commandlets. And there's also some code in SDK that could be improved by removing the calls to the tar tool and substituting then this Right, and this may be, again, if we say what we end up doing for a NuGet package is dropping tar file and the convenient extract methods, then yeah, it's, each of those tools is going to have to write it. Each of those tools is going to have to decide what their policy is when they're on an operating system that can't do the thing, and that's fine. It's their, it's their bug to fix instead of they yell at us of, why did you throw at the first file? We wanted you to do everything and skip the things you didn't support, and gets rid of a hundred feature flags and um, like we can we can make it work 
And then if we want to have an improved experience that's net seven only, then that would maybe be a reason for an inbox component. But um, and the other team is also performance. Uh, Adam told me they would uh, require to use these APIs. Um, yeah, but again, the other thing too is these like, are just convenience, right? This is taking right, somebody I mean, writing their own loop and their own parsing yeah. and concat, and it's not. This stuff, everything here down is the hard part. This is, with the bottom, you could mostly easily do this. Yeah, and, uh, well, I suspect we would eventually get request, a request to add these APIs like we sure. uh, got the requests for SIP. Yeah. Because people don't like handling streams that much. It's, these APIs are, as you said, the convenient ones. And it may be... Our answer for that may be, sorry, that's only available on Net7 and higher. Yeah, I, I am okay with that. And it, um, our contact from VS said it's okay. Are, are there other questions about the API that we still need to go through? Um, well, I addressed the other re, uh, feedback from the previous meeting, like moving the lib open uh, argument from a couple of methods to the end, making sure that the global extended attributes uh, dictionary was passed as an I enumerable instead of an I collection. Yeah, there, right there. Emo mentioned that and I addressed all that. The only thing I, I didn't add was uh, APIs that would take a stream. It's the first item. Uh, overload to tar file that takes a stream and I, I, I didn't have time to test this I would like to if possible uh, propose them separately because it's not blocker for this it's fine uh, I don't I don't completely understand so the, I would expect that the most prominent use case is uh, I either have a .tar.gz file or I want to write a .tar.gz file. How do I do that with the APIs on the screen? Uh, no, not possible yet uh, because there's no way to manipulate the, the stream. Uh, unless, oh, sorry, yeah, you're right, uh, Jeremy. The tar reader takes a stream, which means you can... Um, First, you create a gzip stream, and then uh, the contents that you get out of it, you can read, you can pass them to the tar reader, and you can start iterating on the tar items. And the opposite okay. is true. You can write to a stream with the tar writer, and then the resulting stream that gets the tar written, you can pass it to a gzip stream, and then you can have your yeah. gzip. And I mean, this would just be, you know, create from directory would take, instead of archive file name, it would take stream, destination stream, and extract a directory instead of, as an overload, instead of taking stream, what's the file path, would take stream, what's, where, what am I reading from, and then it would just call those two things. Like, the work of adding it to tar file is easy, but we can certainly say it's deferred until later. Again, these are convenience methods. Convenience, exactly. The... No. Yeah, did that answer your question, Stephen? Uh, the tar writer and tar reader would answer your uh, need for manipulating streams and creating gzips or opening gzips. Yeah, I think we should, we should, as the next issue that gets opened, it should be to address the fact that it's probably a pretty desirable thing. But uh, yeah, as long as it's possible. Right, and I like that. I think is part of where we ended up with the oob question because it's. This supporting compression modes, I think, was weird. There was a layering question of which the oob pivot was one of those pieces. and But certainly, I, we could add stream overloads to this, and it doesn't... I don't see any way that it goes wrong, because it's the same as what you have in the reader below. It, it's Literally, this would call file.openread, call the other one. And presumably that's the first thing this does already. Sorry, file that open right. Um, presumably the 
first thing that extract the directory does after argument validation is file.openread. Source archive file name. Right? And then new tar reader of that stream. So great. Right. Skip and take the stream as a parameter. So if the only thing that was missing out of the proposal is that, we can just add this now and hit approve and yeah. If there's a complication later and we need to split it, that's a modification and a new proposal. Okay. I can do that if if you're okay with adding the two APIs for that. Uh, and one last comment. Jeff suggested that we call that enum that is exclusive for V7 to switch the V7 to the beginning. Uh, I don't mind either way. I think it would, it's better to have both regular file and regular file V7 for auto completion so that you see both. That, yeah, that was my, I actually don't want that. that I wouldn't want people looking for regular file to see regular file V7 and think, oh, version seven, that's probably better. Because it's not true. If, if you're talking about IntelliSense, if you type regular file, you'll see both, regardless of whether the V7 is a prefix or a suffix. Oh, true. True. Uh, yeah, you're right. So. Okay. What, what, did, what does the V stand for on that? Version 7? It is from of AT&T version 7. Uh, I think it was a Unix version where the first version of TAR was added and that name stayed like this is the v7 tar format well, why is tar entry type a byte is that because it's why is it a byte uh that's how it's represented uh, that's the size of uh the tar entry type in the header it it was just easier to be explicit that this is the size, the byte, and it cannot go beyond that size because we only have one byte to put the the, the tar entry type in the header. Yeah, it makes it so that when you're building a tar entry, we don't have to throw for values above 255, but blindly pass through anything else. And then, can you scroll down a little bit? These may have been asked, uh, answered last time when I wasn't here, but um, scroll down further. So all these tar entries that use a suffix, we, we discussed that. I don't yeah. remember we did. discussing. Yeah, OK. It was the, if you're reading a V7 archive, the enumerator will emit these. If you're reading a POSIX archive, the enumerator will emit these. Sorry, um, that's not I meant naming. POSIX tar entry versus tar entry POSIX. Oh. Uh, I don't think we discussed whether the name was, or whether the format specifier was a prefix or a suffix. Um, I like them as a prefix because on, on docs they'll show up all together. Tar entry, tar entry v7, tar entry posix, tar entry ustar. You, you mean as a suffix, not a prefix? Right? Yes. I like them the way they are. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I also like them that way. It's easier to find. Okay, it just goes against our normal class hierarchy approach. Yeah, because normally we use the namespace to group things so that it doesn't pollute, say, all of system IO. Um, what's that have to do with anything? Well, because if if you want them to be clustered, then you know system.io.tar. dot will just the, pull everything up. The, 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 the system formats tar is system what they formats are. tar. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, but net namespace dot will bring everything up clustered together, right? This is a. It's when you go to like docs.microsoft.com. Mm -hmm. Is tar entry POSIX next to tar entry packs, or is it which is next yeah, to tar entry, or does it say sorted on the side packs tar I mean, entry POSIX tar entry, dude. and then somewhere else is tar? That's why. How does that it. differ from every other thing, we, like stream file and, and stream memory and stream pipe? Okay, I'm pretty sure we have it both ways. I don't super care. I just think it's convenient here because it's really it's all tar entries. What most people probably care about, and the sub specialization is a niche thing. Yeah, I, I think we have a lot of places where we either have it as a prefix or we have it as a nested class, but suffix is, this would be novel, but that said, like, I don't really feel that strongly about it one way or another, but it would be an outlier, I believe, to Stephen's point. 
I can't think of one, but I'm pretty sure we've done suffixes before. When it's less likely somebody cares about the thing. Yeah, we can switch it. I don't have a strong concern. It just it jumps out at me as being very unusual. If we do move it to prefix, then I would suggest now for a different reason, v7 regular file, yep. because that would also be a prefix. So you, um, when someone's not using the helper APIs, if they're using the reader writer directly, the reader gives back tar entries and they cast if they want to, and the writer, you you would instantiate the concrete types. Is that right? Uh, the idea is that if you are reading from an archive that has a specific format and you're trying to write to another archive with a different format, internally you would be able to convert it if it finds the, well, with, with all the information that it can find. Uh, with no need to convert because um, the argument type for writing is the base class. So you can pass any tar entry subclass. Does that answer your question? Right. My, my question was, uh, maybe, maybe I just look at the, the signature on the writer, but I, Jeremy had said that these were niche, but I'm assuming if I'm using the writer and I'm creating, I, and I'm creating these tar entries myself, I have to instantiate the drive like one of those oh. concrete types right POSIX tar yeah. entry or okay if, if you create a tar entry from scratch yourself with a constructor yeah you have to instantiate the specific one for the format of the writer but if you just call tar writer dot write entry and give it the the source path then uh, it makes whatever it wants for you mm. right so it's only when you're doing weird things of oh don't use the mode bits that are there. Write down these mode bits instead. So we expect the write entry methods that take a tar entry to be like the 1% use case. It depends on if you think that modifying a tar entry is a use case, but in that case, they're going to just copy whatever they get from this, the reader. I think that crafting one by hand is, my gut says that's a 1% or less use case. Okay. I'm asking because. Uh, I was wondering if we needed some sort of factory API, but uh, it's fine. All right, so in the working proposal, I moved all the uh, tar entry specifier suffixes to prefixes. Um, for the stream-based overloads, just so we can get this knocked out, uh, I went with source and destination. <laughs> the other obvious answer is stream. Uh, I guess there's also a leave open question, but this isn't actually creating an object, so I think it shouldn't be doing any disposing. So, uh, no, so, okay. so I don't think we need leave open. That's The stream was given to us. It's owned by somebody else. Makes sense. It's fine to me. Um, yeah, so stream stream is one naming convention. Source and destination is what we use with spans. Uh, so I went with source and destination. We, we should use source destination because there's two of them. So something's the source and something's the destination, and we have to clarify which is which. Yeah. Well, there shouldn't be one that is a that takes stream stream. No, no, no. I, that's that's not what I meant. There's there's two things. One of them is a source. One of them is the destination. So it, it'd be like having it be stream stream comma string value or something like yeah. string string like that. This is, I modified those. You're going to call one a destination, you call the other one a source. Yep. That's what, what, I, what I went with. Um, these these friendly ones were based off of zip file, like create, for, uh, extract to directory, blah, blah, blah. Uh, can you ask that again? So extract to directory is um, based off of prior art on zip file and other APIs? Yeah. Okay. Even the argument names. Got it. What were you asking about? Um, 
uh, complexity attacks, stuff like that, um, whether people want to monitor for progress, but it sounds like you can do that just by newing up a tar reader and iterating over the, uh, the yep. entries manually. Yep. All right. Um, YouTube chat asks if we want source and destination or source archive and destination archive to match the fact that the paths are source archive file name and destination archive file name. Do I want to say archive? I think, I think for the stream, source and destination are sufficient names, personally. But Why, why do we need archive in the string name? Uh, to let the user know that you are going to be creating an ARC ATAR file. They don't the know that from the name the of the type. I mean, I, mean, that, I guess we have what they... source file does would say that it's a file versus the destination directory and up here source directory and destination file kind of suggests which one's the which, but just a lot of words. <laughs> so you suggest removing the word archive from the strings? I think so. That's fine to me. I mean, unless it's really differentiating something, but I, I don't think it is. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, our archive is already in the type name. That's fair. Hidden. The only other, I guess, yeah, depends on whether or not we ever hook up uh, support for tar gz. If it's, it's, it's it was a source archive, the tar gz is a gzip file before it's a tar file. <laughs> we said yeah, we didn't. You can't this. overload on parameter names. So. Indeed. I was matching the name of the arguments in the zip file uh, static class, but yeah, and and I I think that's generally a good practice to follow too, matching prior art. But we we have the opportunity to like kind of tweak it ever so slightly and make it slightly better while still being true to the design. Sorry, what was the prior art that was mentioned? I didn't hear. Zip file extract to the directory and create from directory. The, the arguments have the word archive in them. Yeah, my care factor is really low. Yeah, no, and, and it's a good point to bring up, right? Um, because we do talk about prior art a lot. But I, what I was getting at is I think in this case, like given that the API shape is the same, um, if you know how to use one, you're just going to know how to use the other. So the parameter names we can clean up slightly. <laughs> the include base directory and override files, that, that all comes from zip file as well. Yeah, um, if you if it's set to true, you would add a new segment at the beginning of the entry name that represents the name of the base folder. All right, we good? Uh, uh, that last piece is interesting. So, uh, yeah, I guess. Where, where, where is this going to go? Yeah, and and how does that relate to when we hopefully eventually add Unix related permission APIs? Like, is we're basically designing that now. This would be helpful for future APIs that need to modify a mode. And since it's a flags attribute, the value that we're setting here is the actual value uh, that is represented as, as eight positions for the Unix file mode. Uh, the problem is if we 
it's weird that we would expose it in system formats tar as a NuGet package. It belongs in somewhere system IO in runtime. I don't think there's a NuGet place we can add it. So if we want to be oob, uh, if we have a need to be oob, then I think enum Unix file mode turns into short or uShort Unix file mode. And like wherever it showed up in the API, that it turns from the enum into the, yeah, here, that it would just turn into short. Yeah, and it makes it much, much easier to handle mode. I agree, but again, it so this is one of, this is in addition to whether or not it can support TGZ, which is almost an implementation detail, this is the one aspect that being oob means we don't have a way of describing this down level. This is not the appropriate package to introduce this concept, and we shouldn't introduce a package just to put an enum in. Uh, so if if this is going to go oob, I think we have to cut the enum. And if it's inbox, it belongs in a different assembly, but which is fine. So where does this enum get exposed today? Uh, tar entry dot mode. So then, why would this be a, the wrong layer? I mean, if the only consumer is basically in this, like this concept, then I go with the namespaces. Unfortunately, to begin with, we could just put it literally in the tar namespace itself. If we expect other consumers of this enum somewhere else in the BCL, then sure, maybe IO makes more sense. But we do. I think eventually we will. Eventually we will. Uh, Eric Erhard could uh, confirm this, but I think we could. We we would start working on adding Unix to APIs, and one of them is the change mod, change mode. It could uh, benefit from this system IO primitives package. Levi says, if that's a package that's not that already exists and ships and is not sealed for complicated framework compat reasons, then sure, we can. Sh we have a package we could shove it in and you just end up pulling down the v7 system IO primitives. That seems okay to me. But what I was suggesting there is uh, like we're, we're, we're clearly creating packages that don't target or creating out of band packages that don't target .NET 7. We, we want to keep targeting .NET standard, .NET framework, blah, blah, blah. Um, as we're introducing more fundamental concepts into the BCL, such as you know Unix uh, permissions, like those are going to have to live somewhere if we expect our OO packages to be able to pick those up. And what I was suggesting with the primitives packages, that's where we start exposing some of these concepts, some of these cross-cutting concerns that we expect multiple different OO packages to rely on. Sure. But the I mean, we should design this, but I, I would. I would guesstimate that if you want to expose my Unix emissions, we would not put them on net new types, right? We would probably put them on types that we already have, which we wouldn't be able to move. Otherwise, we have this Franken design and Bonnet Core, which I don't think we would want to have. And I'm sorry, I, I don't follow that. Why would this? Why would this be a problem? So, like, take for example, what we did with Echoes. Right? With Echoes, we did this super weird design where we moved. They basically we had extension methods somewhere else because we couldn't extend the core types, right? Because of the way we shipped the packages, right? So if we expose more Unixisms, don't you think we would put them on the file type, for example? Do you really think we would have a completely new type in .NET Core if we just put the new the, the Unix concept on? I don't think we'd have new types, but when when we're talking about when when we're talking about simple APIs like enums that will never change aside from maybe adding new values, which can be done in a non-breaking fashion. Like, we don't really have compact concerns there. Well, I mean, the question is, we would not ship an OOP that just has an enum definition in it, right? That would not be super available. So I think if we talk about taking those methods that deal with those concepts, OOP, then we would have to put them on types that we can, right? So that would, that, that's what I mean by Franklin design. And that's why I'm skeptical that we could OOP them in the first place. Does that make sense or am I still... I, it, it makes sense, but I think um, I, I have a feeling that there are lots of other APIs in the system IO namespace that 
people would find valuable if we make available outside the context of .NET 7, and those APIs would be candidates to bring to an out-of-band package. Yeah, um, a suggestion, uh, who gave it? Fred, I think, sorry, Frederick, uh, gave the, said, we can just rename it to system formats tar, tar file mode. And if we add Unix file mode later, they're freely castable. Um, like we can keep the benefits of the enum and then not stomp over the name that we want to use for something else. It costs like, does it have 30 to be bytes of IL. We could just expose it as a short and say if you're setting mode bits, you need to know what they mean. Which, I, think I mean, this, this makes it case? very easy. Sorry, what did you say? Sorry, if it's a corner case, if we just have to round trip the value, we could call it mode raw. Right? They will just give you, let's say, a short. And then later on, if we expose uh, an actual Unix file mode enum, we could introduce mode that gives you the strongly typed version of that. That's another way to, to actually avoid the complexity now. Uh, that's fine. Um, Car Carlos, how how much work was done building a net standard to a version of this so far? Is one ready to check in? No, I didn't write this as net standard. Um, OK, because what, what I am kind of concerned about is there are lots of changes that were made in system IO to the path class and, and other types that uh, that I wonder if you might need to rely on um, for any of your work here. And those changes might be candidates for things that should be eventually moved to an out-of-band package. Like, I, I guess I'm wondering if, does net standard provide all the capabilities that you need in order to be successful writing this thing? Or was there other work that we did in .NET that you would need to rely on to be successful? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Uh, I wrote this with the idea that uh, initially it would be a shared, part of the shared framework, not as an OOP. So um, if we end up deciding it's an OOP, then I would have to make several modifications, I assume. I mean, that I'm not sure exactly which APIs you're concerned about, Levi. But I mean, if this, if the tar file is based on the structure of zip, zip file and zip archive, which have been around forever, and are you know basically only target APIs from not done in framework days, presumably we're not going to hit from the path perspective. Presumably, not, we're not going to hit huge issues there. Yeah, I mean, um, like it's I'm... we'd have to call path.combine instead of path.join and pay the extra two milliseconds of expense, but who cares? I mean, it's, it's, it's stuff like that, right? Like if, if people call this API and we're not able to follow, for instance, low allocation practices inside of this API. Who cares? Uh, I imagine our consumers might, especially if the, Our answer, like we can split compile the thing if it's OOB, we can have a net seven target that uses better APIs and uses lower memory. And if you're on net framework, you get net framework. Like that's, that's our story. It doesn't change the API surface. Okay, and Carlos just if defs within the package? Yeah. Yeah, we would do pretty much what we did in system text.json, right? Maybe basically, basically it was Jeremy suggest. Yeah, yeah would... system text, let me stop you there. System text JSON actually okay. copied a bunch of source code into their stuff and then compiled as internal types. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying we should we should do exactly what they're doing. I, I, th I think the point is just, I think the high level story is net core is going to be better. And yeah. if we have to ship an OOP, then yeah, we have to, of course, live within the physical realities of .NET Framework, right? But I think the way I see it is like, what I'm, what I'm concerned about is kind of API logical complexity in terms of API surface, but implementation-wise, I see it as a tax we would have to pay if we were to decide to ship an OOP, right? I think yeah. right now we haven't made the decision yet, but I think given that VS would be a very likely consumer of this feature, um, we should at least make it possible right and that's just you know if it ever comes to fruition then yeah we can use the null allocation apis exclusively and if it does then we can still decide that we start with the you know the common api set and then make more better as we go right we don't have to split compile on day one but i think it's reasonable to say that you know on the framework you just get a worse experience yeah
but I agree with you. We should not do unnatural acts like copying half the framework into the package to implement feature. Yeah. So for as long as Uber is on the table, the two op two easy options are leave this in the tar namespace and rename it to tar file mode, and it's just it's ahead of when we have the unified feature, or we drop the enum and just call it int or short or whatever we do elsewhere. And yeah, I found it really useful to to use a flag enum. It is entirely useful to use the flag enum in your implementation. One hundred percent. Actually, no, it wouldn't matter because you're just going to call you're going to call stat and you're going to copy the value. Sure. No, who is it useful for? It useful. The one percent that we said are going to create these things by hand. If most people are actually calling write entry and just pointing it at a file, they never look at this. They never care. The ones who do can add an enum and pretty print it themselves. Yeah, but if we're already going to have an enum for internal use, then why not just expose it so everyone can use the enum, which is a well-defined set of values already? It's not going to change. It's the Emo's point of if we add Unix file mode as .NET 7 standard API, then in, we could have .NET 7 API that exposes it using Unix file mode, and we have the .NET standard unified API that calls it raw mode or mode raw and exposes it as an int. And right, but why not just expose both? Because the this UB package is not the right place to introduce a universal concept. Why not? Because why, why if you wanted to talk about Unix file mode, do you need to depend on tar? If it's a NuGet package. Right, but... If but we, if we, and if we later add it to... in system IO, like, file dot get mode like we had to move it in why does it live in tar and now we have to forward it out right which seems fine for an out of band package support i don't like it like like i as a as a user who needs to target things like net standard it is a pain in the ass to have to deal with all of the workarounds and differences between between net standard and .NET Core. And the more things that we can support in net standard packages without having to tell users, well, now you have to go do this huge workaround or, or painful thing or if deffing everything, the simpler it gets for those users. And I think that's general goodness. Right. And yeah. so one thing that also ends up happening in practice is third parties find it difficult to write net standard compatible packages. We're really the only people who have success doing that because we already have an infrastructure set up to do source copy. And if third parties find it difficult to pull the same tricks that we did, or there's feeling like, hey, you know, Microsoft clearly doesn't care about making this component available to me. So why, why would I do this? Like that just hurts the ecosystem in the end. I mean, it sounds like you're just saying we should just give up on that standard, which is less I, work for us. So I, so I, I think I think honestly, that standard falls into a really weird place right now, right? Like if we're sure. if we're willing to say these are primitives that we don't want to make available in that standard compliant fashion, and we just want everyone to copy code, what's the point of that standard? Like it's. It, it, it's weird, right? Either we support net standard or we don't. If we support it, we should make more things available for it, including the primitives that things like system text JSON and tar archive rely on. And in this case, since it's just an enum, we could, assuming the package isn't sealed, we could put it in system IO primitives. That package will pull the enum in for net framework. It's defined there. Well, it'll be defined there for net core, and we could expose it here. It's just that that's across a package boundary, and that's fine. Um, or we include it only in this package and call it tar file mode, not in the system IO namespace, because this should not be reaching out and shoving things in system IO because of composite or component layering. You know? I mean, in a, in a sense, like the, 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 it's a bit weird to say, do we support .NET standard, right? Because the thing is, it's fundamentally a frozen API surface in the past, but right? it's a bit like saying, do we support .NET framework for files, right? It's, it, I think the problem in practice is that we cannot retroactively generally make new features available on all the versions of the platform, right? We have some limited ability to do that with roots, but they, they, are, they are fundamentally costly and they're fundamentally complicated, right? So we only do it on a case-by-case -case basis. So in that sense, we are still doing this if the customer is asking us, 
but we're not out of we're not going out of our way to ship every new feature as a new fan. So I think that's why I would say we do support net standard, but we do it in a way where it's limited, right? But it's limited because it's a thing of the past, fundamentally, right? Yeah, it's not but a then thing that we actively evolve. But but then every single time we have some uh, external community member or in particular MVPs and employees going and creating their own non-official packages that provide these types anyways and just, you know, make it even harder to use because they're not part of the mainline scenario. Like, it, almost all the types we've exposed that we've said, let's not do this because the community's not asked for it yet, has resulted in some community member, MVP, or employee on the .NET team going and making that package anyways. And I think that's still reasonable because let's not forget that they have the same limitations or the same constraints, right? If Microsoft ships a system package, there is a real expectation that this is backwards compatible in all cases. It will install in every project type cleanly, right? If some random employee makes something available down level, they can cut corners, and they very often do. And as a result, also because it's a random person package, it has like a 5,000 download maximum, right? If we push something out, it immediately gets 10, 15, 20, 30, 40,000 downloads. It's immediately used in, in more places, so it is more costly, right? So I think it's still fine to say we don't make available everything, and then, yeah, if there's demonstrated demand for things, then yes, we can add it later, right? I, 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 I don't believe that just because somebody is making something available down level, it immediately means we have to make that a supported thing. I think there I mean, is it's still somewhat a problem. It sounds like a failure on our part to have a sustainable package model for the things that we ship. Well, I mean, yes and no, right? I think we have a sustainable package model for things that we know are always out of band, right? The problem that's always sticky for us is that, I mean, take TAR, right? If we know that the TAR is always going to be out of band, it's fine to be in the NuGet package, right? But as soon as we have one built-in uh, component trying to use it, let's say ASP.NET, then the discussion starts. Okay, now we have to edit to the shared framework. Well, what happens now with the package? Can it unify cleanly, right? And, and that is complexity that, you know, only the platform team has. Nobody else has that problem. Plenty of other people have the problem. They just don't have the, you know, enterprise backing to be able to scale and support it. If you go look on NuGet, there are plenty of issues covering this. And the fact that no one else is able to make this work because they don't have the tooling and, and stuff oh, okay. set up to do it. When you say this, what you're referring to, like you, like I was just commenting on your statement about a sustainable package model. I think our package model is sustainable for things that are purely packages. As soon as you interact between built-in component and package, that's where the complexity is, right? And, and realistically, yeah, I mean, maybe community members have that problem because they want to bridge platform differences like we do. But I would generally say they only apply to platform level components. They don't apply to, you know, pure oops in that sense, right? I'm referring to to customers going and filing issues on NuGet for things like, um, I can't easily support multiple packages with a shared with a with a single shared surface area or with different surfaces surface areas. They can't go and produce packages for individual operating systems if they want to do something that's windows specific and a variant that's unix specific they can't go and produce a package that integrates with the rest of the the ecosystem properly there's there's just mounds and mounds of these issues here uh, that we're forcing on users by not just going and you know integrating what users are asking for into what we're shipping yeah so i think that's a different problem i i, I agree that one is the thing we need to solve which is basically the whole multi-targeting experience is not great on you guys but I think that I think the problems that we and our team have, because we have our own tooling, that's not the problem we have. Right? The problem that we have has to do with, you know, just reasoning about backwards and forwards compatibility when you start having oops that are kind of also in box on some versions of the platform, right? And I'm saying that's a problem that nobody else really has. And I think that is also, the, I think, why it's reasonable for us to say we only solve those things in cases where we know it's useful where we have evidence that, that it's actually required. And for the rest, we just say, yeah, sorry, if you really want this thing, you need to copy the source code, I'm sorry. Like, we're not going to make every single thing that people would find valuable available down level. It's just not sustainable for us. If it's not sustainable for us, is it sustainable for our consumers? Right, so. No, but I think the story generally is they have to move forward. <laughs> um, 
in, in trying to respect uh, people's time and the uh, relative productivity of the meeting, such as it is. I think right now, maybe the easiest answer is we call this system formats tar, tar file mode. Uh, and if we can come up with a proposal later of finding a way to include a system IO Unix file mode in net standard 2.0 in a way that works, because Eric has pointed out that we don't have a system IO file system dot primitives package uh, that was last produced for net standard 1.3 during dot uh, net core 1.0. Um, so if we find a place to shove it, then we can put it there and go back to a unified enum, and otherwise we'll be on split, which is the same as if you use monoposix right now, you would have to cast to this enum anyway, and we'll work out that story later, which can be in a different proposal. That's my suggestion. I agree. Let's make it part of um, system format star. Jeremy, strike the gavel. No one, no one's countering you right now. Do it. <laughs> I have um, to type more words. Separately, uh, since this is now done, uh, we're at five blocking, thirteen seven point oh, and fourteen future none issues with more coming in, in daily to weekly. Can we start scheduling secondary API review on Thursday so we can get through the big issues and the backlog? I mean, I'm totally up for that. Like, I'm in Vegas until Friday because of the conference, but I, I, you know, we can totally set up. A, I can totally set up another meeting for Thursday, ten to twelve, and then, then we can just go through more of the backlog items. Yeah, but Jeremy would have to host because um, I, I, I yeah, have I've, conference like that. So I'm not available to start Thursdays this week. Um, if we start putting them on going forward. Um, to drain the backlog, that works for me. But this particular Thursday, I already have conflicting commitments. I, I, I don't think it's that work for you. Like Wednesday or Friday. Um, Wednesday and Friday both work for me. Just Thursday's the bad day. And unless there's pushback, I would suggest Wednesday because Friday I think is bad for. Uh, people in different time zones, yeah. And then let's just do tomorrow another round, maybe. That sounds good to me. I'm just concerned about it continuing yeah. to creep up with it being so close to build and all the other deadlines. So. Uh... No, I think you're you're right. I think it's the thing we need to do. Uh... I have naming questions on the current API. Like some of them don't follow our standards like m time and a time but then like the reason it drew my attention to it is the unix file mode we did try to name them like we would name c sharp apis um i try to keep the name exactly like it's represented in the header so should we and... do the same with tar file mode then I mean, where? What would you call tar file mode, right? Because it's just O, no, the, o the, E the O elements, W. The yeah. The, I just mean, what would you call them? I would call it like it is in the header, like like we did with the rest of the APIs. That's, uh, I think, I O underscore execute. Um, there, I don't know why they have T in the beginning. I'm assuming that's for tar, but then it's O exec O write O read. There's no underscore. Okay, I was thinking of the POSIX one, which I think is O underscore exec O underscore right. But uh, like if tar I, has I kind redefined of, them with a T, then. I, I kind of want to push on the, the first part, though. Like, why? I'm in .NET. Why do I have M time and A time? We can call them access and create. That it, seems. It feels that's except that's it's more not .NET create time. It's not create time, actually. It's not matching what we have in SIP archive. Okay. C time is the the last time you modify the metadata of the file. Which is a it's really not... good reason to not name the C time. <laughs> A time. Well, M but, time. That, but that's the name of the field in the header. C time. It's also but I'm, A time. I'm a and it's also time. I don't really... Yeah, but generally speaking, most structures that represent protocols, uh, we we do sometimes keep the actual protocol names. Um, because that way people can uh, relate it back to the documentation for the spec. Yeah. Um, it, we 
should really be able to do that in the docs for these ones because C time to change time, A time to access time, and M time to modify time isn't too big of a jump for people to recognize. And if they type A time, IntelliSense yeah. will still show it. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And while change time isn't the time that the file changed, it's the time that the inode changed, it is still called the change time value. Yeah, I, I think um, I think the bar that we've set in the past is, like, if, if it's an API that we reasonably expect the typical developer to use while they're using other .NET-isms, um, then it should follow .NET practices, as you had suggested. But if it's an API that's only going to be used by people who are, for instance, already parsing tar, um, then using the names that the rest of the tar parsers use is preferred there. So the question would be, who, who uses this API? Which audience is it? Um, whoever wants to analyze individual files, I don't know. Well, if, if would I have a reason to use this API if I'm doing anything other than like implementing tar reader? You would only use the, uh, hey, Emo, your calendar has fallen out of date at API review schedule. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, again, the only people who would be using these are people who are writing their own version of extracted directory. Or they're doing weird stuff with rewriting a tar based on what the file system would have done. So they're already in tar land rather than .NET land, it sounds like. Yeah, but e even if you're in tar land, I, I there's a lot of names which are. Uh, I think I think there's a difference between a name that is C compatible and that's a potentially bad name because of you know uh, design practices they use in C um, or for uh, you know Linux kernel etc. Versus a domain specific terminology where people aren't going to recognize it if we give it a friendly name. And and I don't think change time, access time, or modify time are, are in that scenario. I think they're very much um, ju just APIs that were named badly because they were designed in, you know, the 80s and 90s with C. That's a fair argument. I would buy that. Um, it looks like there were some comments in chat that... Yeah. Yeah, it's, the, it's a Google test, right? If you have to enter the term in Google to figure out what it means, then you should not alter the term, otherwise you don't find it, right? But if it's like some, if the concept is obvious, like creation date or modified date, then we should just stick to our name. It's not obvious though, because we don't even know what C means. Change. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Jeremy it just posted in chat. Yeah, somebody had to Google it to figure Indeed. it out. Indeed, and and that goes. So I agree. We should. Call this access time. We should call this change time with only one C and with an N. Uh, and M time should be modification time. And the extra C in access? <sighs> What's with you we're, people we're wanting things to be spelled C's. correctly? Yeah, I'll alter my statement. If the thing should be obvious, we should name it an obvious thing. Yeah, and you name and G name to username and group name. With the right number of views. EID and UID, same? I don't know. That one I feel differently about because I feel like UID and GID are kind of like, we can call it group identifier, but nope, like it's just the GID and the UID. Yeah, those are more universal concepts. Agreed. Yeah. Is it modification time or modify time? Wikipedia says time of last modification. If somebody wants to find a Unix header that says modify and or modify instead of modification, I don't care. Um, as in, I will accept that. Not, I don't care that you found the source. <laughs> yeah, the actual POSIX spec says the uh, uh, file modification time. So yeah. I guess modification is fine. Do you
Okay. Are we happy? Are right, enough of us present still to say that we have quorum? I see a lot of faces still out here, whether or not the people are actually at their computers. So, are we done with Tar now? Or is there more stuff coming? I believe we're done with Tar pending any modifications that come out, such as dropping the entirety of the Tar file class for net standard. Due to logistical right. complexes. Um, or logistical Carlos, complexes. did you... Did you give a prototype already to VS? Not yet. I think it would be probably good to at least validate the scenario of what you have. Yeah, I have to make all these modifications first. And then see whether we need to make adjustments to the API surface. It's right, okay. but I think we can call this approved, and like every other of our approved yeah. APIs, it's pending further details. Yep. Yeah, we can that discuss works. that later. Uh, we would just create a new proposal for it so we don't have to come back and figure out what we're actually looking at in this one. And... Yeah. God, why do I hate myself? Um, does anybody care about calling FIFO FIFO? <laughs> I'm fine with FIFO. Like that seems fine to me. I, I don't have a preference. But... Yeah. Alright. Yeah. Would, would it be lower case... Is the second F lowercase or uppercase, though? I think it's one four-letter acronym. So, yeah, that's, it's correctly yeah. cased. I, I'm yeah. used to seeing it just like all caps, FIFO, LIFO. Right, which is why it's a four-letter acronym. Yeah, I, I think what you have there, Jeremy, is correct. Following normal naming conventions. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. Celebrate with the dog. <sighs> okay. Uh, nosotros estamos terminados con este API review because we are way over time and my Spanish may or may not have been grammatically correct. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.